Africa's lions have declined by half over the last 20 to 25 years. In this presentation, I'm going to speak to you about how the Lion Recovery Fund and Partners is trying to, to fix this state of affairs, to try and halt declines and reverse things. Lions are one of the world's most iconic and beloved species. They're keystone species. Um, as top predators, they have a disproportionate impact on ecosystem functioning. They're flagship species, so their charisma and popularity mean that they're an excellent ca candidate vehicle, uh, or vehicle for raising funding for the investment in, in savannas writ large. And they're umbrella species. And this means that the conservation interventions needed to conserve lions will um, confer conservation benefits to all savanna species. And indeed, to conserve lions, one needs to invest in, in three things, really. Firstly, protecting lions themselves from the threats that cause mortality to them. And in doing that, um, it, it results in, in the protection of a wide range of other species. Um, we need to protect the prey on which lions depend. And then, but clearly, by definition, that means protecting a wide range of other savanna species. And we need to protect the habitats that lions need. And, and coincidentally, the habitats in which lions live a whole range of, of other biodiversity exists as well. So, so protecting lions results in the protection of a wide range of savanna species. And this is one of the reasons I'm so excited by lions. They're not only are they beautiful and majestic, but also they are in, incredible species through which to achieve wider savanna conservation. And as an example of this, um, during the three years of, that the Lion Recovery Fund has been operating, We've invested in over 33% of the range of, of endangered African wild dogs, including in some of the areas where the species is most imperiled. So how does the Lion Recovery Fund work? Well, we raise funding from a, a wide variety of sources, and then we take 100% of those funds and invest it via a science-based strategy into the best ideas for lion conservation. There are three main types of projects that we support, namely support for the management of protected areas. So Africa has a truly vast protected area network, most of which is underfunded. Science indicates that if, if Africa's protected areas were optimally protected and managed, they could conserve between three and four times the number of wild lions that currently exist. So we invest heavily in the support for the management of protected areas. For example, here at, uh, in Zukuma in Chad, so this photograph of this ranger is from Zukuma, which is a site where the Lion Recovery Fund has invested heavily to help African parks in this case expand and strengthen their um, management and law enforcement and also better understand the threats that, are, that lions are facing. We invest in promoting the coexistence between people and, and wildlife. So just to explain this slide to you briefly, this is a traditional Maasai corral on the edge of Serengeti National Park. So those hedges around the, the livestock are protecting the livestock from lions and other species. And indeed, we, we so as part of the coexistence piece of, of the puzzle, the, the Lion Recovery Fund invests in, in helping to tackle human-lion conflict, in helping to incentivize coexistence between people and wildlife, and also helping enable communities to practice wildlife as a, as a land use in the areas in between and around protected areas. We support efforts to tackle the illegal wildlife trade, so this is principally the bushmeat trade and trade in lion body parts which I'll come to shortly. Um, but it's important to just to pause briefly and, and make it clear that the next few decades are going to be seriously tough for Africa's wildlife. Human populations are growing very quickly at a time when governance challenges and corruption are still pervasive. Uh, poverty is endemic and funding for conservation is still drastically short. And that doesn't, uh, there are no signs that that's going to change at any time soon. So this creates a perfect storm for for wildlife conservation and the next few decades are going to be super tough. However, at the end of the light, there's light at the end of the tunnel and in the long run there's cause for optimism. Human populations will ultimately stabilize and even decline. Governance is already improving and, and you know, in, in decades to come will be a lot better. Um, poverty is declining and I believe that mechanisms for funding conservation both domestically within Africa and internationally will, will strengthen and which will make conservation much easier. So I believe that if we can shepherd Africa's wildlife through this human demographic storm, the, the wildlife that comes out the other side essentially I think will be there in perpetuity. So the responsibility is, is ours collectively, globally, to really step up to the plate and strengthen conservation efforts now and over the next two or three generations. So where are we at three years in with the Lion Recovery Fund? Well, 
Um, the fund has, has developed real momentum over this time. You can see some statistics that I'm not going to repeat on this slide, but one of the stats that I'm most proud of is the fact that we've had donations from over 2,000 uh, individuals from the general public. And, and this indicates that the wider WCN family and the public at large have really helped to build momentum for the fund because it's those smaller donations that together end up helping us build momentum and attract the larger and uh, foundational and corporate donors. So every little bit helps, it really does. The LRF is adaptable and nimble, and this has really come into its own during this year, during the COVID-19 crisis. So the crisis has clearly principally been a humanitarian um, issue, but it's also affected conservation really badly. In Africa, this has principally been through a reduction in funding for conservation and an elevation of, of some threats facing wildlife. And this has come from economic hardship, from, from increased poverty, and from re-influxes of people from urban areas where they were working back to rural areas, placing greater pressure on natural resources. So we've responded to this at the LRF by issuing a series of, of emergency grants to help ailing conservation organizations continue with critical and essential conservation services and make sure that rangers are, keep having a job keep with their boots on the ground and keep uh, keep doing the, the critical work that they're doing without having to be laid off, which I think is really important. So, so far we've invested $1.7 million this year in emergency grants. We've adapted to emerging threats such as the emerging uh, poaching crisis facing lions by help, investing in a number of projects that help understand and tackle this threat. And we, we've started investing deeply in the sites that, that are most promising for lion recovery. And feel free to come and ask me about some of those investments after the presentation. We also invest widely and by now we've developed a really significant pool of, of grantees and we foster collaboration among them to increase the impact they, they have and innovation. And a good example of this is going to be described by John Kamanga who's the, the, the head of the South Rift Landowners Association who I'm very proud to introduce you to. So John is a very impressive figure and Seralo is an organization that we've been super impressed by and we're very uh, proud to be supporting. John is a grassroots conservationist. He's from the area in, in which um, he's trying to conserve lions and other wildlife. And I think in, in, a, in a way he demonstrates what the face of conservation in Africa in future is going to look like because grassroots conservationists like John um, their messaging is going to resonate so much more with local communities and, and governments than is possible from um, from outsiders. And so I'm, I'm proud to introduce you to him. Thank you for the great introduction and for the opportunity to present our conservation story with you. When I think about my journey in conservation, the one person that keeps coming into my mind is my dad. He was a great teacher. He took me out when I was very young and saw our environment through the eyes of the cows. The space that we share with wildlife is one that is an interesting one to tell uh, how that has shaped my whole thinking about how to run a conservation program today. Cows were the thing that every day you had to bring back home well fed and secure from wildlife. And yes, we shared the same space. We were going to watering points with wildlife. We were, you know, sharing the same grazing spaces on a daily basis. And we actually saw very little difference between our cows and the wildlife because they were part of our story. Of course, there are many species, there are many species of wildlife that we lived alongside with. Elephants, buffaloes, and of course the cats, and mainly the lion. And that is an interesting part of my story in conservation. The lions, uh, you know, as dangerous as they, as they are. I have interacted with them from a very young age. While I was going to school, because we used to live 
10 kilometers away from the school that I used to attend, as a youngster, I would walk every morning to school. And one of the constant things that I found on my way to school were the lions. But just imagine that. You're walking to school and you're only like six or seven years old and you have to interact with the lions. And many at times, we ended up not going to school. And that was always an interesting story the next day to tell your teacher. But, yes, it might have been interesting at that time growing up as a kid because, you know, you couldn't even understand the dangers that you are, you, you, you are exposing yourself to. But really, living alongside these cats is very dangerous. People have lost lives. They have, we've lost livestock, you know. But however, communities have found the willingness to stay with them. It's not only that that is a threat to wildlife or to our cats, but also the population in Africa is growing and therefore towns are coming closer to where wildlife used to be. And that is a real threat to our wildlife and of course the populations of people who live alongside wildlife. I grew up in a dual kind of education system. I used to go to school, but when I come back home, I will engage myself with the culture of my community. And that was interesting because part of that culture was also going out and hunting lions. But I was too young at that moment, and therefore I used to just follow the crowd and come back home, you know, and that's to the tunes of the warriors who managed to come home celebrated as um, lion killers. I, I give all my training to elders. Elders were a big part of our, you know, environment training, conservation, living alongside the wildlife. And, and this is why I keep remembering my dad because he was part of that story in a big way. As I grew up, then of course I will transition uh, into a different arrangement that will start me off at a different level of conservation. And this was when I was given an opportunity uh, to lead my community. And so I started to practice my leadership skills of how do I make sure that the community benefits from the environment. When I was given the task of leadership, I looked around to see what best fits, what best fits that environment, but also will be a livelihood source for my people. And the one thing that came to my mind was conservation. Why? Because as I was growing up, I had an opportunity to actually move out, you know, across the country because as a youngster, I was a fanatic butterfly collector. Little did I know that that would be the entry to my conservation career. And so we started this idea of, of, of uh, pulling in a conservation area that will then also attract investors to build tourism lodges that will employ people, but also will bring an extra dollar that was required to complement the livestock economy. And part of that was also to start to train youngsters to be able to go out there and track lions. Of course, traditionally, we used to work. Actually, when we started um, our conservation work, I used to challenge uh, the researchers that I will find lions before they find them with satellite um, equipment. Just because I understood that environment very well. But because that story was so good in that particular area, a lot of the other communities living alongside my community wanted to also start that story. They also wanted to invest in tourism. They also wanted to start in conservation. That will lead us into creating the South River Association of Land on Soralo to then scale up our work to cover an area of about 150,000 square kilometers. And that area, as big as it is, sits on a, in a very important landscape. It sits next to the Mara, next to Amboseli, and of course along the Kenya-Tanzania border, that on the other side you have Serengeti and Gorongoro. It was possible for us to connect that landscape because the community was one. It was the Maasais who practiced uh, pastoralism. They moved about in the landscape that they believed was theirs, regardless of what boundaries were there. 
whether among us that community or even in trans 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 in, in, in international borders like Kenya and Tanzania and they believe that that whole land is theirs it was also important because they also had the same concept of management of that landscape so era madare you know it was management managing it and keeping it and and husbanding it for their livestock and the people who live there it's because of that that we were then able to create a vision for soralu yeah which which really is about maintaining a healthy and intact landscape for people and wildlife and of course with an open space that has wildlife in it of course yes people but wildlife more important is also a good story for the cats because of that we have a thriving population of of the lions in that area which i will later know in my life when i was growing up i did not know that the populations were going down but now because of the interaction and and the papers that we are able to read and understand what is happening we we are very glad that our area is able to keep um the remaining lions in that landscape and actually see their population go in doing that we engage different groups of the community whether that is rangers who go out there and just make sure that our wildlife is safe and protected from possible poaching because um because of the challenges we have in that region sitting in the Kenya Tanzania borderline and people within communities who occasionally want to benefit from wildlife trophies or game meat um our scouts become a very important part of that um, control but we also train youngsters who go out there and make sure that they understand movement trends where the lions are so that then they can come back and inform the community so that they can make sure that as they are using that landscape they are they are keeping they are keeping safe distance from the cats and yes occasionally it's interesting how we interuse the space this is part of our team of researchers and right outside the doorstep of a Maasai home where lions footprints that means that at night lions are using the same space that lion people are using during the day it's a reality and you can see that because of the pastoralism in nature of the community there when people move out of their homes lions find safe space they are relaxing as if that is their own home of course yes that is their own home but that's not to say that we are living without conflicts and a lot of the time what we are fighting what we are trying to create a balance is to make sure that we minimize the conflicts a lot of the times you get you know livestock predated by lions and what we try to do is make sure that we are out in that space to make sure that we try to bring back livestock back home in with whatever way including using our trucks to pull you know bring cows back home when they are lost so that then we protect them from the lions it might be seen to be difficult but that cow looks like it's in a comfortable space that is the back of our truck for us to be able to create a space that people are sharing with wildlife we 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 try to put the communities first and we we bring them to meet with other communities and tell their story so that then the communities can be seen as protectors of wildlife rather than the story that is out there always that they are the biggest enemies of wildlife and yes we have managed to actually uh, put them to be in the first line of protection there there are stories of people especially Kenya wildlife service a couple of years back wanted to take a prob- what they thought was a problem lion and to our surprise the communities were up in arms and said you can't take our lion you have to justify where you are taking it and why that for us was quite a moment to to show that communities were really protecting their wildlife so of course in 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 making sure that that space is protected we are creating an area that interconnects with other very very important landscapes the south rift region has uh, densities of lions between 60 and 100 because it keeps fluctuating 
but it connects to two important land, other landscapes, the Greater Mara Serengeti, which has about 3,000 to 3,500 lands, and the Greater Amboseli Savo ecosystem that also has about 1,000 to 1,500. So genetically, if we are able to keep that space open and interconnected so that then the lands are able to move across, then we have a healthy population. We are working in such a big area and we needed to bring partners to support us to be able to save our lives in this diverse landscape. Luckily, one of the partners that we found was the Land Recovery Fund, who did not only give us funds from um, uh, their program, but actually connected us to other donors who are able to raise, we, we were able to raise an additional $350,000 to continue to uh, support our programs so that we can see our lives protected. And that is, you know, so we have, we have initially, uh, we were only covering about two communities in our lion uh, protection work. But today, because of their support and the partnership that has grown, we have been able to add another 10 communities to that. That is very, very good. And we hope we can continue to grow that relationship. Apart from them supporting us, they actually also come to the ground to understand what is happening on a daily basis and that we are able to then uh, create programs that they also understand. One of those moments was during the COVID, COVID period. The, you know, because we lost a little, little bit of funding from our partners, they were able to come in to give us additional emergency funds to then be able to support our teams to be out there and to be safe in doing their work. That partnership has continued to see our cats being happy. And we have a very um, healthy population of cats and we are very, very happy to be part of that story in many ways. Particularly myself, having grown in that area, and having been part of, you know, the traditional processes of going out and going to hunt lions. And yes, I was never a celebrated lion hunter. But today, because of the conservation work that we do, I'm, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a well-celebrated uh, conservation leader. And that is more important for me. Rather than being celebrated in one village, I'm celebrated globally. And that is an attribute to my dad. Unfortunately, a week after I received the news that I was getting another award from the Task Trust, my dad was on his deathbed and passed on a week later. And that I'm not able to celebrate that glory with him. But however, we will make sure that in his honor, we continue to protect our lives. Thank you very much. Ashule. So, in closing, thank you very much for your support. Um, every single bit of support helps, as I, as I said, and, and it's 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 your support that's enabled the LRF to have the impact it's, it's had. The constant message we've had from the field is that while 2020 was difficult, 2021 is going to be worse because funding shortages is going to be worse and the threats are going to continue to elevate. So the the Lion Recovery Fund is going to work really hard to be in a position to ensure that those critical conservation um, services continue during this difficult time. And that's only possible with your support. Thank you.